thank you all very much for joining us and uh, we're we're hoping this is going to be an insightful and engaging discussion uh, about green and sustainable fi financing and how that plays into um, the boardroom. We want to touch on a couple of things and discuss hopefully dynamically um, how both green and sustainable financing affect uh, companies in the region um, and what can boards do um, to improve their performance on uh, ESG. Um, I will start by introducing myself um, and the Middle East Institute of Directors, and then I'd love to welcome um, our speakers, uh, Chris uh, McCo and Olivier Bird from the London Institute of Banking and Finance, and they will do a much better uh, present introduction of themselves, so I'll, I'll allow each one to do that. Um, so my name is um, Ali Khadr. I'm the, found, the CEO and founder of the Middle East Institute of Directors. I, I'm a lawyer by profession. Please don't hold that against me. Um, but I've realized a passion for governance and sustainability quite some time ago and have detoured into that. Um, so ESG, environment, social governance, sustainable financing is, is very close to my heart. Um, and thankfully, I found others that feel the same way. Um, the Middle East Institute of Directors is a relatively newly established entity um, focused on the GCC and advancing corporate governance. Uh, it's a not-for-profit entity. Having said that, it has been in existence for about eight years in the region. Um, so we're not completely uh, new to the scene. ESG is, is, an, is, a, is a very important topic and it's increasing in its importance and, and more and more companies are paying attention to it, particularly in the Middle East. Um, stock markets have issued sustainability guidelines. Um, there's ESG indicators um, and investors and stakeholders are increasingly paying attention to that. So, so as a result, we, as, as an entity dedicated to supporting the region, we wanted to invest a bit more effort and energy into raising awareness and raising the bar on, on these issues. Um, we plan to do that in a number of ways. We, that we launched a dedicated program called Sustainability in the Boardroom, our upcoming programs on September 5th, and hold webinars like this to discuss these issues and see, get input from experts and, and feedback from uh, the audience about concerns and, and issues. Um, so without further ado, I think that's a short and painless introduction. Um, if I can uh, please have Chris introduce himself. Yes, thank you. So uh, my name is Chris McHugh. I run the Centre for Sustainable Finance at the London Institute of Banking and Finance. And sustainable finance, I, th I think one of the things we'll unpack in this conversation is a lot of the definitions and the terminology that people use. So, so for me, sustainable finance, we talk in terms of things like the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, um, the Paris Agreement, and various ways which financial institutions can align themselves to those types of um, targets and initiatives. My, my background is um, financial markets. I spent 25 years trading and structuring derivatives. And so my particular interest in this is to think about what happens maybe in a bank or a, for an investor, an asset manager, or inside a corporate when a decision is taken um, about a project or a financing that relates to sustainable finance, what do people in the room need to do and think and what questions do they need to ask in order to um, support and justify the decisions that get taken? So if we think about that in the context of the boardroom, I'm very interested and, and get sort of interested in the research side of what questions should board members perhaps be asking around sustainability as they, as they take those decisions? So we think of sustainable finance in a systemic way. So it is um, all, all corporates and banks and investors are operating within a, a system which includes governments and regulation and, and to think about how all, these, how all these different elements fit together. And I think that's the key to, to understanding the overall environment. Um, so our particular interest as an organization, as a research center, um, we want to do things that are impactful for um, people that practice sustainable finance, the people that sort of perform actions and take the decisions around these, these types of issues. So I shall finish there and hand over to my colleague, uh, Olivier. Thank you, Chris. And, and thank you, Mali, for inviting us both to, to speak today. Uh, my name is Olivier Beru, and uh, I, like Chris, um, 
Uh, I'm the founder and um, the um, uh, director of the Center for uh, Governance, Risk and Regulation at the London Institute of Banking and Finance. Um, and what that all means is that, um, um, like Chris, I um, and my colleagues in the center have a, a particular focus on um, you know, the practicalities. So we are practitioner to practitioner. Um, you know, that, that's, our, that's our, our mantra, really, to try and and help people who are in the positions that we are ourselves in um, as practitioners and uh, unpack what some of these issues are in terms of governance, risk and and uh, regulations that you know, are making our lives interesting or difficult um, and exciting sometimes. So obviously the um, uh, topic of sustainable finance uh, is, is certainly one of these. Um, I guess that's one of the key factors for change at the moment, uh, you know, that and um, uh, the uh, digital transformation uh, of, um, of the world uh, are, are two of the key aspects of, you know, uh, governance risk and regulation as it all evolves. Um, like Chris, I have um, spent some time in the city. M my background is more in terms of ratings. I spent a lot of time in rating agencies, uh, more uh, recently Moody's. But um, that's me in a nutshell. And uh, I'll pass back over to you, Mali. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, gentlemen. That's very um, insightful. Um, I, I do want to pick both your brains. I think um, we've all had several conversations. And um, to something you mentioned uh, some time ago, Chris, I, I love the way you said it is is changing the lens through which investors uh, look at. And, and I want to build on that, if I may, as a starting point. Um, so... And for Chris, I think I'm going to put you on the hot seat and say, you know, those questions that the boardroom should be asking, um, what do you think they should be? And Olivia, as you mentioned, again, making it an integral part of their thought process, how do you go about doing that? Um, is it, I mean, because it's not an add-on and it's integral, what's the difference? What does that look like, uh, both internally and externally? Um, so, Chris? No, let me, well, let me let me go first. I'm sure Olivier will will, will uh, come in just when he when I need him. Um, so so in the context of um, the way of thinking about sustainability, I, th I think there's been a journey that uh, a lot of people have been on, and I think initially sustainability was seen as an extra task. So I, I run a business, um, I raise finance, and now I have to start thinking about sustainability. It's an extra process, and I have to. Uh, probably the wrong expression, people sort of, well, tick some boxes, report on it, et cetera, and explain. And it also, is, for those reasons, I think largely been seen as a bit of a burden or a cost. The journey that people have been on perhaps in the last three or four years has been one where gradually my sense is that organizations are beginning to realize that rather than seeing this as an extra process, it actually is, as you use the word, the lens, it's the the phrase I like as well, that's how one should look at doing business. So actually from the beginning, I, I set up my company and I think about how should I operate sustainably? And then I will have access to the funding flows from banks and investors as a, as a consequence. And, and if you like the mechanic, I talk about the system, banks and investors are looking for ways in which they can uh, explain the way that they finance corporations. So, so for me, why should a corporation align itself to sustainable or, or ESG practices is really, uh, if you accept that's a business model for the future, um, you know, an organization will find it easier to fund itself and find more funding and more willing funders if they're able to explain what they do in that framework. Thank you. There's so much now. I have so many more follow-up questions. Um, so, so um, Chris, you talked about, you know, how do I operate sustainably? And, and in as much as I fully support that wholeheartedly, um, the term, I feel that the term sustainably has been also an abuse term. What does it mean to operate sustainably? Because effectively, you're either generating enough revenue to survive, and does that make you sustainable? Or is it a, a much a deeper a rooted meaning? And how do you build how, how does that relate to the SDGs? Yeah, thank you. No, it's actually, uh, that's quite interesting you phrase it that way because it is, when it's phrased, are you sustainable? And, and the answer is, are you unsustainable as the alternative sounds very binary, doesn't it? Um, maybe, maybe an alternative way of looking at it is 
Um, if you have a sense of which metrics as an organization are relevant to you that you should be measuring and tracking to demonstrate how you can improve performance, that's a way you can, you can I suppose, articulate what sustainability means to you as an organization, and then monitor that and work to improve on those particular metrics. So without going into too much detail, there are a range of frameworks out there which people like to look at to give them a sense of what metrics are relevant for my industry. Um, I think the one we see most of all, it won't come as a surprise, is the emissions reduction. That takes a very high priority, as we can see just from looking in the newspapers today. Um, but there are many, many others, whether it is through water consumption, water efficiency, um, waste reduction, recycling. There's a whole range of different metrics. So I think each organization needs to decide which metrics are most relevant for itself uh, and then put frameworks in place to measure, to monitor, to react to those. So then you get away from this idea of digital, sustainable, not sustainable. Uh, it comes back to this idea of a journey and a transition uh, and an organization just, uh, for me, needs to map out um, the journey it's going on and, and demonstrate to itself and as, as Olivia says, to stakeholders, how it's going to, to achieve that. And, and to what degree, perfect. Um, which takes me to a follow-up question I have for Olivia. You talked about the journey, um, but and you talked about the stakeholders because stakeholders want it. So would you say a, transforming an organization to become more sustainable um, is a top-down, is a bottom-up approach or is it a top-down approach? Uh, let's start with that question. Then I'll have so many more follow-ups. <laughs> Yeah, um, no, that that's a really really good question, and um, you know, if it's only a bottom up approach where it's the new generation that thinks that the company is not not, not sufficiently um, engaged, or it's the people trying to make things happen, you know, do, closing that sale uh, or, or entering into a, a a contract with a supplier, and the, and the supplier is asking questions that they can't answer because the company is not monitoring what it's doing. So so that could be seen as a sort of bottom up. So you know, the pressure from the stakeholders would gradually bring this up to the board and the board would suddenly notice after a while or or more or less quickly that you know oh, we we seem to have more and more issues with our suppliers customers and 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 therefore we need to do something about it now that is probably going to happen it is a good thing etc but i don't think that's how i would um set about um dealing with what the board needs to do in any organization because that that would be reactive and it's it's i think most likely to end up in the company not being able to take advantage of any opportunities because it's not being strategic and deliberate about it. So, um, you know, like in, in all matters to do with, you know, leadership and management and, 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 and boards, you know, the board is there to validate and set the strategy with senior management. So that's the first thing they should do. You know, how, how do we become uh, you know, a sustainable organization. What are the relevant, as, as Chris said, and what are the relevant metrics? You know, if I am involved in anything that has to do with um, agriculture or manufacturing of, you know, IKEA as a good example. You know, manufacturing of massive amount of furnitures. You know, clearly, where, where does the where, where does the raw material for all the stuff I sell in my in my shops? You know, where does that come from? And and can we demonstrate to our clients that that these are um, these are sustainably sourced um, uh, products, for example. So, you know, setting the strategy. Actually, can I just come in there? Because you did ask me to comment on the SDGs. Um, just, just very briefly, I mean, the SDGs are, are useful in that they're a universal framework that a lot of organizations will try to, will explain their activities relative to that. But there's quite a few things the SDGs don't do. Um, it doesn't tell you how to do this. So you lack the, the transition. Um, and also, Quite often, the SDGs were not designed to be an investment framework. They were designed for a sort of, if you like, a development mandate. So for many companies, they actually say, well, well great, I'll, I'll talk about the SDGs, but I have my own ESG framework that actually has priority. And the SDGs are part of that, but actually companies will, will lay out their own definitions that they choose to, to follow. So it's a bigger than just the SDGs on their, on their own. Okay. I... I, I Okay, I agree with everything you guys said, but I have one reservation and I, I would like your input on. I'm the first person to, to appreciate uh, metrics and KPIs, but I also recognize that the KPIs and metrics are not enough to truly integrate and change the modus of operation of today. And, and if anything, the pandemic has raised that red flag. Uh, so, 
how do we inherently, and, and what is the sense of urgency of looking at the way we operate through a sustainable lens, and how do we strategize on sustainability at the boardroom level um, in integrating sustainable issues, ESG issues, um, into the core of our operations? Where do we begin in doing that? Or how does an organization begin in doing that? Because it's not just about the metrics. The metrics, in my humble opinion, is a secondary. It's not a primary. The yeah. floor is yours, whoever wants to take it. Do you want to go first, Livia, or should, should I just dive in? Um, uh, no, go ahead. I'm, I'm happy to. <laughs> I, I think where I would start is um, let's just take for the sake of argument if we talk in terms of ESG, so environment, social, and governance, without even talking about metrics, I think it, it, it is possible for a company to sort of have a view and say, well, what is our relationship to each of these factors? So if somebody asked us as an organization, um, how do you affect the environment or, or where do you fit in? Where do you touch the environment? I should be able to articulate that. I should have a view on my uh, what social issues I'm potentially touching, um, you know, and that will vary by industry. Um, and similarly, I mean, I will defer to Olivier on governance, but I think it's important for a, an organization to be able to say, what, what, what is our governance? What does good governance mean to us? And then from that, when somebody says, well, okay, show us, show us what you mean, that's when you, you do need some sort of metrics in order to, to explain that um, and give some evidence. You've, you've driven me to go into two directions. And I will, um, one which is how within an organization, the different departments can work together. And I know Chris has a lot to say about that. So I, I will defer that for now. And I, to, to what you were saying, Olivia, you've touched on the regulatory driver towards the tipping point. Um, but what is the non-regulatory driver? I mean, we're, we're all very conscious that the markets, um, especially in the Middle East, and I know elsewhere, are predominantly made of non-regulated businesses or you know, SMEs, family businesses that aren't regulated by central bank regulations or even stock exchanges, um, but simply general companies laws, which, which have, which mandate and require very basic ESG requirements, if you will. So if it's not a regulatory driver, what is the other driver that, that should, should, um, should attract these companies to integrate ESG or to look into ESG and, and to benefit from ESG? I mean, something I always tell companies I work with, if it's something you're going to have to do sooner or later, don't you want to do it well and benefit from it instead of just have to do it. So the same applies here. Sooner or later, whether it be in five, 10, or, or two decades down the line, ESG is going to become a regulated mandate. To what extent, extent remains to be seen. But until that time, don't you want to build an infrastructure within your organization, get the competitive advantage of doing it well and, and, and leveraging it to the best interest of the business as opposed to tick boxing exercise? So what would be the non-regulatory driver? Let me, I, I can't resist jumping in first, I think. <laughs> um, I, I'm actually a little bit skeptical that regulation can be a driver in the, the long run. I mean, we're still fixing the financial crisis. So we're 15 years in. And I, I for me, the, the other drivers will be through the capital markets and the, the ways in which investors and banks will come out and actively look for companies that sort of um, live this process. So all other things being equal, a company that focuses on ESG is likely to have a lower cost of capital and better access to funding than one that isn't. The other thing I think is quite important to note is even the best in class company today is not even going to be where it is. It needs to transition enormously over the next 20 years as well. So even if you're the best in class, you still have another 20 years and you're going to have to transform. So, so uh, and the regulation will catch up. That's that's my view. So I'm slightly different than Olivier on that one, perhaps. And I think you know there are useful examples out there of companies that ha are going at different paces. So uh, when I was thinking about examples to give you, um, you know, Rio Tinto came to mind as a, an example of recently, uh, you know, really putting its its foot uh, in it. I mean, it it just it just made a major blunder. Uh, authorized the destruction of a site in, in Australia. 
um, and and didn't seem to really apply the right governance and the right reaction to this, and, and that created a lot of um, pain for the company, for 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 its its, its directors and its shareholders. Um, so so that's an example of when a company sort of you know sees firsthand about you know what are the drivers, and the drivers were were not just regulatory. I mean, as you said, there were there were many other aspects, including reputational, including you know. Um, access to capital and cost of capital, clearly. Uh, another example, which would be useful to, to look into for, for uh, our listeners is uh, the company, a French company called Danone, uh, which um, had until recently a uh, someone who was positively messianic about uh, the um, environmental uh, message. And um, I, I think one could argue has been ousted because he might have been slightly too ahead of his time or a little bit too uh, passionate about it and, and maybe neglected that you know this is a journey and that you have to take everyone with you including your shareholders and uh, you know the board um, and so uh, you know there's a degree of impatience i think also with those who are the main um you know the main uh, uh, proponent of this and 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 realize that yes you know you you've got to bring everybody with you and that you know, um, assuming that everybody who doesn't get it is is not clever enough to get it is not going to be the way to win the argument, <laughs> and we've seen we've seen this in in many in many uh, circle you know recently. Um, so, um, I, I mean, I agree, of course, that you know, th- that's not just regulatory. Uh, I think regulation is an important part to play, and in a way, you know, the supply chain examples you've given me in the past, uh, Chris, is is a good example of how, you know, in effect. You know, you have a sort of regulation that presses on various parts of the supply chain, and therefore you have a sort of extension of regulation, or, or, or of expectations at least, of standards um, that basically goes and 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 uh, you know um, invades all parts of the supply chain. Yeah, there's definitely a corporate to corporate angle to this as well. So I've talked a lot about, uh, you know, we talked a lot about bank to corporate, but um, yeah, the examples that spring to mind in in a good way. Um, uh, a company that's always uh, two companies in Europe that have always had a good reputation for this are um, uh, Unilever and Philips, who actually will embed res- sort of sustainability metrics into supply contracts. Um, another one that is a sort of a, another good example is a more recent one. There's a dairy company. I think an example I might have shared with you earlier uh, in the Netherlands called Arla, who has 16, 17,000 individual small suppliers uh, in the forms of small farms. And they've decided to take it upon themselves to broadcast information back to these, these farmers to enable them to improve their performance. I saw another one the other day, which I believe is Aldi, the German supermarket chain, again, is now facilitating through the supply chain and helping the suppliers uh, to manage their emissions as well. So I think that there's, this is definitely, um, again, in my my world, sort of a systemic trend, corporate to corporate. So so in fact, for, for those people listening that are suppliers to large multinational corporations, you may expect the pressure to come from the banks, but it may actually come from your customers. Okay. Um, all right. Thank you very much for that. Um, I do want to touch on another angle. Um, and it's something we, uh, you had raised again some time ago, Chris. Organi- we talk about integrating sustainability within the organization, but often the organization is not built on an integ- integrated ESG system. Um, so yes, you have a supply chain department here. Yes, you might. I think the example you used at the time was an engineering business, um, and, and how would an engineering department look at ESG issues and how does that, how does it look at the metrics for ESG? Um, And and I'd love to hear your thoughts, maybe share with the listeners the the whole silos of operations and and ESG needing to cut across all of these silos or integrating all of these silos so that it can be effective. Yeah, it's probably, it's probably the sort of, yes, we we talk about silos in, in all sorts of different areas i suppose it's sort of a fact of life in 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 corporations the one that the one that for me that springs to mind is i guess bearing in mind my background is very much on the financial markets and thinking about how investors and banks engage with companies that the route of entry for that is most likely be through the cfo uh through the the group treasury the corporate treasury um that's the area which the the organization is probably having these conversations with banks and investors about um, what disclosures they make um, 
what kind of targets they may have. Whereas actually the people that facilitate those measurements are in the operational side of the business. So, so to use the engineering example, uh, in an engineering firm, uh, if you like, the the it's all about the design and the engineers. It's not about the finance department. So, so if an organization can't connect those two silos, if you like, if if the engineering divisions don't understand the importance to the company of getting these issues right from a financing perspective, I think there there's a gap that needs to be filled. Um, Olivia, how how do you think integrating um, the, the different silos conceptually, maybe from a strategic level or um, to get everybody on board, because at the end of the day, I mean, we all know that to get to an ESG, a true, genuine ESG solution, um, everybody needs to be, you know, rowing the boat in the same direction. Um, it doesn't help when your finance department is just trying to tick the box and find the right indicators and your designers are just saying, okay, this is what the market is looking for. So how, how, how would you suggest Again, I, I go back to sort of um, one of the things that we talk about a lot when we talk about leadership and um, how to make change happen. I mean, this is you know another story about change management. Is it's, it's you know how do we make that change happen? And um, you know the tipping point theory is useful. And another one that we already mentioned, the the other one that's really useful is is the idea that you, you don't convince people necessarily through facts and figures. I mean, people are inundated with facts and figures, and of course they're important, and it's good to know that we can measure things. And we've talked about all these KPI and the limitations of this, and you were the first one to push back and say, look, that's not really going to be enough. And and I agree with you. And I think, um, you know, storytelling comes back time and again, and again about how to convince people within the company or uh, you have examples of storytelling doing very well by companies that create sort of a brand, create an image, etc. And, and I think storytelling is at the heart of the success here again. And at the, in particular, at the heart of the two extremes, i.e. those who can take full advantage and by the storytelling their clever storytelling make themselves I, I, I be identified with a clean environment. So, you know, a company like Patagonia, the apparel manufacturers manufacturing clothes that, you know, are not only for the outdoors, but they are made in a way that is, you know, sustainable. Apparently, I haven't checked personally, but that's what I'm told. I can vouch for that. Okay, that's good. And, and also, you know, the, the commitment of the of the leaders, the commitment of the leaders uh, who, if, I, if I'm not misinformed, you know, have made enormous uh, commitments to the environment through, you know, action and, and buying land and, 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 and ma ma managing it in a sustainable fashion or protecting it, etc. And so there you have, you know, if you think about that story, you know, it's, it's a complete story in the sense that, you know, you can believe in the leadership because you know that they're completely and utterly convinced and they're actually putting their own money there. And then everything they do... Uh, follows from that and then the products that they sell are more desirable because of it and by the way they are very expensive products but you still buy them because it gives you a certain glow right so you don't just buy you know a jumper or or, or a, a, a you know a, a, a wind a cheetah you you buy something that projects a certain image so i mean i'm not i don't have shares in patagonia by the way so so i'm, I'm just i'm just saying you know uh, this this is a very coherent story of of you know believing in it taking another angle, and I know we touched on this a little earlier, um, the supply chain. And I know um, in this part of the world, um, a lot of the driver towards ESG, in, in addition to the investors' drivers, and, and we'll come back to that in a minute, um, but a lot of the times for companies here, they, they want to export or they want to uh, partner with um, foreign entities um, that there is a requirement today to, to demonstrate some ESG compliance. Um, I'd love to hear your perspective on the pros and cons of that being the number one driver and how, or how can we leverage that uh, to maximize it um, and, and how does that potentially change behavior, if at all? I'm not sure I would think of it as sort of a pro and a con. I think it's become a way of doing business that, um, you know, in the same way, well, if you think of other metrics, the companies would have had to have uh, conformed to. Um, I think there's just sort of an expectation that suppliers would need to adapt to match expectations from their customers. Uh, so it becomes part of the brief. So if you wish to supply us, then 
these are sort of the considerations we take into account, the non-financial considerations we might take into account with your your bid or your you know your submission for for a contract. Um, and I think I'm going to feed Olivia sort of a semi question here because I think one of my feelings is that when you when you are um, how can a large organization um, have reputational damage? It could be through the supply chain. Um, there might be questions they ask inside the boardroom, and I'm this is where I'm feeding Olivier a question really. But uh, you know, where in our supply chain could those unfortunate surprises come from, and how do we mitigate against it? So I think and I, we talk about opportunity, and it is an opportunity, but there is also a risk management component through the corporate to corporate link. Um, and we've had examples in, in Europe of um, social issues and um, people breaking wage laws in the supply chain, but the company feeling that they'd somehow uh, immunized themselves from these risks um, through, through supply contracts, but that didn't work. Now, I think um, um, we skipped a, a very key question. So if you allow me to kind of take it to the basics. Um, as somebody that's been working in the sustainability space for over a decade, terms such as sustainability financing and green bonds and variations of those confuse me. Um, so I, I would appreciate, I mean, Chris, I know this is your area of expertise and, and I would really appreciate um, in an explanation, a brief explanation about what they are, what does it mean to businesses? Is it is it purely a financial um, tool for the financial sector or does it impact all businesses? How is it leveraged? As much information as you're willing to share, um, I think we'd love to hear it from you. Sure, so I'll, I'll try and be uh, succinct. So um, a green bond uh, conceptually is, is a very specific um, use of proceeds. I borrow some money and I can point at some specific projects to which those funds will be applied to. Um, and I call them green projects because they conform to some definition of what is perceived to be green. And there's a lot of work in regulation about what actually that means. But let's say simplistically, it could be a wind farm or a solar plant. So it really is a, a way for a company to say, look, I have an activity. It is green by some definition lend me money and it will go directly to that project. Now, what happens, the benefit to the company is um, because of the supply and demand for bonds in the capital markets, um, the evidence seems to suggest that it's slightly cheaper to borrow money if you can demonstrate that it is going to flow to those types of projects. So it is very uh, sort of a quite a mechanical capital markets instrument. And it's called a use of proceeds instrument because what I borrow must go in a particular way and feed certain causes. Now we've got um, similar things. We have blue bonds. We have other types of use of proceeds instruments. And all they are is investments that align to a specific end project. This has now evolved into a world of... Sorry, yes, go on. Sorry to interrupt you. And are these statistically or from your experience known to have better returns, uh, be more successful, or are they equally, you know, risk opportunity as the other bonds, each one unique to its company and owners, et cetera, issuers, sorry. Yeah. So um, in terms of the, the, the riskiness of the instrument and the economics, the green bonds and the conventional bonds, um, they could have the same risk, but the evidence seems to suggest that it is slightly cheaper to borrow if you're issuing a green bond and they have slightly better trading characteristics from an investor's point of view. So um, again, it's, there's a lot of argument in academic circles about it, but but let's, let's just sort of, in essence, they seem to be a little bit better for the company, um, but the whole, the whole activity benefits the company overall. I mean, ultimately, if a company uh, only um, invests in solar plants, that doesn't need to issue a green bond necessarily, but they still might. But it, it's just a way of tying your activity to specific financing. Um, now, this has evolved because not every company has that type of activity. And we see now a new category of bonds called sustainability linked bonds. And those are more about, we come back to the KPIs where a company says, look, here are my targets. This is what I'm going to try and achieve. Um, and there may be some financial benefit to the company for achieving those targets. And those are bought by investors. It's the same type of funds that are looking for those. 
as for green bonds. And so there's potentially a small financing advantage that's available for that as well. So this has been the capital market solution to aligning corporate activity to specific investments. I mean, it takes us down another family of things. We've now got more of perhaps from Olivier's side, the, the ratings-based approach where companies are given ratings and investors will reward companies with better ratings and maybe their cost of capital goes down. But these, these are, the, as I say, these are the non-regulatory solutions. This is the capital markets trying to find a clean, efficient way for aligning funding flows with sustainability activities. So why would a corporate do it? Um, it will stand out relative to the competition if the competition are not doing it. Uh, and potentially, uh, at best, gives it a small um, financial benefit through, through its cost of funding. Thank you very much. I know a lot more about it now than I did when we first started. <laughs> um, I'm very conscious of time. Um, so before I wrap up, I, I do want to give you gentlemen a chance. Um, if there's anything you want to share that maybe I haven't asked about or, or poked on or um, the floor is yours. Olivier? I think you've, you've covered a lot and you've um, kept us on our toes throughout. So <laughs> great. Thank you very much. And, um, you know, I was thinking of examples in, in the, um, you know, in the investor world where, you know, people have made a big, big um, statement. I think BlackRock, we perhaps should mention. I, I don't know if you'd agree, Chris. I think they've, they've started Absolutely. to really make a, you know, make a big difference and make sure that people pay attention. I also noticed that... Um, Recently, shareholders in uh, BP, Exxon, uh, and a few other um, oil companies have obtained, um, you know, the the or have have forced the companies to commit to much greater disclosure about environmental risk. So, you know, putting this back on the companies, you know, um, now they have to come up with something that shows just how exposed they are to, you know, maybe the, the sort of stranded assets issue, uh, and that's going to be really interesting because. You know, a lot of these companies are, are valued on, you know, the uh, reserves that they have. So, you know, that that'd be interesting to see what their response is to that. Um, and, um, you know, it's always interesting to go back. And I did in, in preparation for this discussion to go back to the Norwegian Wealth Fund, um, you know, report on what they decide not to invest in anymore. It's a, it's a big wealth fund. It's, it's sort of um, funded by oil money, which is interesting in itself. And and they have some very strong commitments as to you know what what they would invest in and not and and um, and they have an annual report there that that is very useful for people to realize just to what depth investors will go into, in order to differentiate between companies and what other topics um, that that would make a company appear on the blacklist. So um, just a few thoughts for our listeners, perhaps. Yeah, I would just say from from my side, I think it's it's it would be interesting for those people that are listening at least to ask the question and if, if one starts to talk to um, banks about how they're viewing companies and, and reporting what sort of what the attitude is towards lending to companies I think there's plenty of free free advice and free thinking that, that can be be drawn on um, I'm, I think again making it regionally specific it definitely is a topic with banks in the region um, so I would I would uh, you know, it's it's free to talk. I would I think it's probably a good discussion to be had with between companies and their and their banks to see what uh, the prevailing thinking is. Okay, um, that's a lot more food for thought for for additional discussions. And although I can keep uh, asking many many more questions and picking your brain on uh, and expertise uh, on this topic, I think uh, thank you very much for your time, and uh, hopefully we get to talk again soon. This was a pleasure, Manny. Thank you so much for having us. Thank you very much.